Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have a big group uh, this morning. I uh, hope you're enjoying Summer Institute. Um, our session is called Solidarity Not Charity, Challenging White Saviorism with Learning Partnerships, with this, which is a, a slight adjustment from I think what we have uh, in Sketch, but um, I think you'll see why. Uh, so just to briefly introduce ourselves, uh, my name is Erin Carey, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm an ELL instructor at Lindell Education Program in South Minneapolis. Um, my name is Chris Kloss, my pronouns are they, them, um, mm -hmm. and I am an ABE instructor at the Hub Center, or sometimes we call it St. Paul ABE. Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Tammy Twiggs. Um, my pronouns are she and her. I also am a teacher at the Hub Center and under the instructor um, for the GED program. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm just going to get us started this morning with some guiding principles. Um, and uh, we've used these in a couple other presentations. I think um, some of the credit goes to uh, Wendy for putting these together. Um, so here we go. Uh, the first one is uh, we're going to do our best to listen respectfully to each person without interrupting. There will be t time for people to um, turn, turn their mics on if they feel comfortable, uh, to write in the chat, um, and uh, submit other written responses. So kind of listen respectfully in all of those modes. Um, and when you're when you are speaking or writing, um, be speaking for yourself. I think this session particularly is really aimed at self reflection for instructors. And so talk about your experience and what you're reflecting on. Don't try to tell somebody else's story or your students stories. Um, and also don't correct other people's experiences. We're all coming at this from different perspectives, different identities, and um, different levels of awareness. And so let, let people share uh, where they're coming from and keep these conversations confidential. We, this is a recorded session, so we're trying to give you opportunities to uh, respond anonymously if you don't feel comfortable, um, but also don't like, you know, say, go, go back to your program and say, did you hear what so-and-so said? <laughs> um, we, we're just gonna respect each other's learning in that way. Um, something Tammy has reminded us throughout developing this session that I think is a really great way to enter it is, um, can we just sit in our discomfort? Uh, I think a session like this is 45 minutes. Um, it's gonna be like uh, swimming in Lake Superior which I don't know if it ever gets comfortable when you're in Lake Superior, but the longer you're there, you sort of adjust. Today, we're just dipping our toes in, so it's gonna stay pretty uncomfortable. We're not gonna solve anything by the end of this. We're gonna get our thinking started today. Um, as people are sharing, again, we're all in different places, so assume positive intent, but also we're all in different places. So you might say something that somebody else responds to, and um, maybe calls you in on. Um, so please uh, accept responsibility for your impact. We will try to do the same. And then take care of your needs as they arise. Um, if you need to get up, move around, leave the call uh, and come back, take a break, we understand. Okay, so we are going to dive right in here um, and talk about what this session is about. Um, so we have brought up this term white saviorism and white savior complex. And this refers to um, a mindset that we uh, want to uh, discuss as a group here today. So just to kind of give us a common definition to operate from and, and we will build on this as well. Uh, the term white savior is uh, comes from a, a critical orientation toward this attitude, uh, a, a description of a white person who is depicted as liberating, rescuing, or uplifting non-white people. 
um, uh, it is critical because uh, it has uh, originally been maybe uh, applied toward third world people or currently I would say any person of color uh, in situations where they're denied agency and seen as passive recipients of white benevolence. Uh, so this term white savior comes from a Rudyard Kipling poem, uh, The White Man's Burden, which was about, uh, uh, he was, uh, you know, lived in India under British rule and uh, was inviting the U.S. to colonize the Philippines uh, at, in the late uh, um, 19th century. So uh, I have the first stanza of a long poem here, take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives need, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. So I think we can all observe a lot of uh, attitudes uh, that are uh, potentially being commented on, but also are very like um, saturating mindsets of uh, of uh, colonial um, uh, thinkers at this time. Um, and uh, so this is something that people have referred to when talking about uh, the attitude of white people in uh, the idea of helping unfortunate people of color. Um, so at this moment, is there anyone in the chat um, who would like to um, maybe add to uh, this definition uh, or provide any reflection or, or context that any, any additional knowledge you have around this term? We kind of want to have some group consensus around it. Anything you know or associate with this term? Yes, okay, colonialism for sure. Ah, Peace Corps, I love that someone said that. Yeah, I think there are a lot of sort of um, forces in our society that have been considered, um, yeah, white supremacy that have been considered uh, benevolent over time that we have come to realize are like soaked in this, um, you know, top down, the white people are here to help the unfortunate non-white people, uh, this mentality. Okay, oh, Lawrence of Arabia, what a good reference. Oh my gosh, yeah, we're, you're gonna see his face in our video in just a moment. Um, tied to colonialism, manifest destiny, white supremacy, nonprofits, Kaya, word, uh, <laughs> teaching the language of the ruling class, uh, didn't they come here to be like us? Whoa. I want, did you hear that from another teacher, Krista? Holy moly. Institutional racism, white saviorism versus advocate. Okay. Um, ESL classes being offered in church basements. Yeah, I think the origins of, of our literacy education environments definitely are, are tied to some of um, these attitudes. Oh, you're a better man than me. I think that's a Gunga Din reference. Yeah. Missionaries, absolutely. Yeah, and these are of course complicated histories that are that are tied to this term. Okay, thank you everyone for sharing. Oh, English only policies, yes. Yeah, so we have a video um, to share with you. Um, giving some examples of white saviorism as it's depicted in popular film narratives. So the white savior trope. Um, and uh, this video starts by talking about how there was a huge audience that suddenly started streaming the film, The Help, around the time of the protests surrounding George Floyd's murder. So I'm gonna start the video and if there are any audio issues or you cannot hear it, please do respond in the chat. I'm gonna go off camera so we can get more bandwidth. Thank you. Oh, I don't hear it, Tammy. Okay, you said you could not hear it. Right. Okay. Movies on Netflix. Can there you hear right now? One in the U. Could you Can hear you that? Full caption too. Mm hmm Yep, I am trying. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hang on a second, everybody. Let me hit the closed caption for you all. Sorry about that. 
and we'll try again. You is smart. You is important. For some reason, my closed captioning, I'm hitting it and it's not going. Does somebody want to grab the video from me? Because I will stop sharing. Um, I did practice this last night and I'm new to Zoom, so I apologize for the glitch. Um, could you hear my audio and you just couldn't see the closed captioning? Is that what's going on? Right. We might not have closed captions. Um, I have the CC button, but it's not popping up for some reason. Um, so should I proceed or would someone else like to do the video? Uh, Tammy, will you click that settings, uh, that little gear right there? I'm, I'm clicking and on it right now. Off. Yep, click that and see. Let's see. If uh, I, I might not have them. It probably doesn't have captions. It's fine. Okay. Sorry. I think that was maybe an interpreter. So yeah. Do you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Just play that. Play it. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. 2011 film resurgence in popularity. Oh, audio has gone again. I think it might be a connection issue. Uh, what do you think, um, Erin? The, the link to this video is at the end, right? Yep, it's it's linked in our session notes if our co-host is able to play it. Tammy, yes, I can, I can play it for you. Um, it's just in Google Drive though, so it won't have the YouTube captions. Okay. I was thinking maybe too, if we if we can't get it going, we could keep moving um, just for the sake of time. She, so Tammy has shared her sound, everyone. It's just, we think it's a connectivity issue. Would you like me to play it or not? Yes, please. Okay. Thanks, Elizabeth. A story about a white woman, right? Oh, boy. No, we lost our audio again. Well, sorry, guys. It's a good video. Uh, it is linked in our um, session notes. So maybe we should just continue and you can you can watch it on your own. It's really fantastic to demonstrate some of the tropes of the white saviorism. Um, and uh, it's a really good analysis of a variety of different movies that um, that get into the white savior trope. So I do recommend the video. It's really cool. Okay, so I'm gonna go back into the presentation and thank you for your patience. I'm glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> it played beautifully in three times we met together, um, but for whatever reason that has, that's the way it is right now. So we're gonna go on to the next portion. And um, Aaron. A story about um, a white woman. <laughs> Aaron, I think I'm gonna take over from you unless you had one more thing that you wanted to say. Go for it. Okay, all right, let me go to full screen here. Okay, so I first want to um, talk about the fact that this is very small print, but it will be in the presentation so you can definitely see it later. And of course, you can enlarge it on your own screen if you're able to do that in your device. Um, but we do want to talk a little bit about um, some of the work and I want to give credit to Jody Versaw. Um, she did a presentation. If you look at the bottom, the title is ABE Programs as Spaces for Liberation and Social Change. So we wanted to take that concept as we look at the, the idea of white saviorism, we wanted to apply it to adult basic education. And we wanted to go backwards in time to see where did it begin? Um, what were some of the conditions and the historical contexts in which we found ourselves um, with good intentions, oftentimes thinking we were doing things that were beneficial, but as we look back on them through the lens of history, we can see that sometimes these things were actually very harmful to people of color. So as you look at the timeline and you focus on the far left-hand side, 
Um, we can go back in time, and then we don't have a date here, but we're predating 1850, so going back to 1500s, 1600s, all the way through probably the early 1900s during colonization, which I saw a couple people post in the chat, uh, during the time period of slavery with um, the slavery going on between Europe and the Americas in particular, but in other areas as well. And then focusing in the United States on, on native ge genocide with the indigenous populations. So at this point in time, um, English instruction, we call it instruction, uh, in this period was related to forcibly moving people, <clears throat> forcing people off their lands, like in terms of the indigenous people, um, removal of people, um, a Eurocentric cultural indoctrination and systematic erasure of people's first language. So this was a time period where um, the goal was to uh, eliminate, erase a person's primary language and culture in order to instill in them the primary culture or the, the dominant culture, at, which at the time was European um, ethnocentric, Eurocentric um, cultures and ways of being. Um, further education was denied. So at this point, we're focusing on making people uh, become assimilate into uh, the predominant culture. If we fast forward to that period um, of the 1850s and 1860s, we're talking about the time period leading up to uh, the Civil War in the United States, which was that 1860 through 1865. Um, in the middle of that time period, we had slavery uh, being challenged. We had people escaping to the North. Um, we had the Emancipation Proclamation. And then not until the end of the war did the 13th Amendment pass where we had the abolishment of slavery legally, um, but people started to create past that time into reconstruction, um, something called Freedmen Schools. Um, these were federally funded programs, recognizing the fact that we cannot um, pass a law abolishing slavery where people were denied the right to be able to read and write and then expect them to fully participate in society. So the, the beneficial, uh, the good thing that people thought they were doing is, is providing this money so they could create these schools. And the schools were designed to emphasize student duties. What are your rights? but primarily in relationship to the white race. So again, it was focused on making sure people were able to assimilate and become less of themselves and more of that um, majority white race. So that's what the schools were focused on. And we could probably push that time period construction went all the way through the 1890s. Right around the same time overlapping, if we look in the middle, the 1890s up through the 1930s, we moved into a concept called the settlement houses. Um, these were a little different because they were focusing on uh, people emigrating to the United States from other places. Um, so in order to help them, many of them coming with zero Eng English or very little English, um, the literacy focused on integrating non-English speaking immigrants um, through the process of language classes, and then also to help them become citizens um, through naturalization classes. Still up to this time, there was no focus on a person's primary culture, their primary language, or what should we do about that? At this point, the focus was always about assimilating into the white culture um, with its language, its, its mores, its value system, its politics, everything that we would emphasize and say that's good for you um, may have been uh, intention. The intention was beneficial, but may have actually caused harm to people because it was um, not an opportunity to hold on to who they were, but they had to let that go in order to assimilate. Moving into the 1950s and 1960s, as we move in towards that era, what we typically refer to in social studies as the civil rights era, um, we started developing citizenship schools. Um, so we're moving into strict literacy classes, um, civics classes to help people um, become familiar with the government of the United States and the politics and begin to address um, some of the discrepancies in the voting laws. So um, in some states, there were literacy tests that people needed to pass to be able to vote. So regardless of whether they were citizens, and eligible and had registered to vote, if they did not pass the literacy test, they could not vote. So this was a big, huge push and an emphasis to get people 
not only to be able to vote, but be able to pass those literacy tests. Um, and those did start previous to this time. It wasn't just in this decade here, but again, people were focusing on how to get people prepared and ready to be voting educated citizens. And I'm gonna pass it off to Erin. She's gonna talk about 1964 to the present and then some questions for the future about how do we do things differently? Clearly in the past, there was good intention, um, but now that we look at it through the lens of history, we can see there was a lot of actual harm being done. Erin? Sure. Um, so from 1964 forward, uh, we're talking about, well, you know, sometimes the uh, attitudes of a society towards uh, a, a discipline like uh, education can, you know, be tracked through legislation and where's the money um, to sort of, you know, represent where the attitudes were, where the investment was. So um, it's it's kind of a, a varied roller coaster story um, in in US federal legislation around adult education. But uh, the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 um, was uh, the first one that moved ABE funding under the auspices of the US Office of Education. Um, so this is where funds came in to train uh, teachers, establish grow programming, support research, curriculum development. Um, and uh, adult education was being framed throughout the sort of uh, mid, or mid to uh, late 70s, uh, 60s and 70s around um, addressing, you know, full human potential development through education and, and including literacy skills as part of that uh, beyond just uh, a person's role in the workforce. Uh, in 1991, we had the National Literacy Act, which is where we get a lot of our national ABE systems and measures of program accountability. Uh, this was an independent law um, and was very uh, expansive in terms of responding to learner needs and goals compared to previous statutes. Uh, it did not necessarily just confine, confine this, uh, like the, our measure of progress um, to employability or workforce performance. But then we get to uh, WIA and WIOA where um, it falls, instead of being its own independent law, is it falls under a, a larger workforce development law. So this is where our... Um, funding is under uh, OCTE and is um, starting to, programs are much more accountable to tracking whether people are attaining or advancing in employment through their adult education. Um, and um, the uh, a lot of the framing is around the ultimate goal of ABE being um, as, you know, contributing to our uh, economic progress as a nation. So um students are maybe measured more in terms of being a return on investment and uh as opposed to us having an attitude toward education as a fundamental human right and i think there's a, a through line from the colonization uh that tammy talked about to our abe practices today when we look at some of these uh legislative um attitudes toward our, our learners so the work going forward potentially is both dismantling white saviorism in our mindset, but also seeing and combating racism and discrimination um, in our work, in our own um, program settings, but also in a broader view toward our students and um, how we're funding adult education in our country. So, um, here, um, we have decided to get very personal as presenters and share um, some uh, very local to us uh, examples of how white saviorism attitudes can show up in, in what we do. Um, these are some old Facebook posts of mine that I dug up and am sharing with you uh, today. Uh, here's uh, an example of some attitudes that I have exhibited in my career toward my own students. This one says, uh, I have a new student in my class who's never used a computer before. He's a man who's probably in his early to mid twenties. Imagine you're young, you're educated, you're very smart, but you've never yourself typed on a keyboard or clicked a mouse, let alone use the internet. So 
in this post, I see myself kind of insidiously causing harm, um, despite the slippery slope of having these good intentions, right? I'm sort of making a show of my own privilege and my own naive worldview of what people should have as skills, what's normal. Um, I'm kind of othering my student here. I'm positioning myself as a good knowledge haver, right? I know what's important to know, uh, which then leads to a negative perspective on the all of the knowledges that my student has. Here's another example. Um, my student wrote in his journal that his father was a well-known intellectual and his whole family is famous in Somalia. I swear I will someday learn some conversational Somali so I can dig deeper in cool moments like this. So this is very condescending, I find, of me. Um, and it has a very clear sort of deficit-based orientation toward my students, the surprise I have that his father would be an intellectual. And one more, I think, a few of us have done this in our day. Uh, oh my God, oh my God, my students are so cute right now as they're beginning to research their reports on US states. So classic infantilizing of my students, patronizing attitude toward my students that they are cute. Um, I think we um, have, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of this in our field and um, it's something that uh, we, we all, uh, Chris and Tammy have a couple more stories but we kind of want to talk about ways that we're trying to change this orientation and attitude toward our students. Chris, do you want uh, to go first? Yep. Um, so I wanted to share um, some people brought up sort of missionary and the literacy program in a church basement, um, which I think, you know, it definitely has a, a presence in our field and um, that's you know how I was raised and wh where I maybe found a way into the field and um, the picture of the socks here on the screen is a reminder of a story early on in my career I would buy my students Christmas presents and I like knew enough at that point that I wouldn't call them Christmas presents. They were, these are just gifts from your teacher before we go on winter break. Um, but I had this student who would constantly take his shoes off during class and um, his feet smelled terrible. And so I was like, this poor man doesn't have any socks. I'm gonna get him some socks. And so that was his gift from me. And lo and behold, he never wore the socks. And um, you know, that it, on further reflection uh, helps unpack all sorts of attitudes and thoughts that I had about what he needed. Um, I'm really trying to solve a problem I have, not he has, um, you know, that should have been a conversation between him and I about foot odor and, and all sorts of things. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're going to dig into sort of how those attitudes have changed in, in further examples, but this was like a really sort of representative story for me of um, where, where I started out. Um, and I know we're a little short on time, but I just want to add my own personal anecdote. Um, as we mentioned, we want to apply this to ourselves, and that's hard work to do, and that's where I came up with that quote, can we just sit in our discomfort because these are uncomfortable conversations so as we look at the jam board and think about examples we're reflecting on our own practice so for me personally um going to college getting my degree in the early 90s i'm really dating myself now um, as an english major uh we were taught to uh promote the canon of literature uh, especially the canon of american literature and european world literature so in my early years, uh, my, it was my late 20s teaching at the Hub Center when I was the first uh, in a new teacher there. Um, of course, I need to bring in To Kill a Mockingbird. And if you watch that video later that we were not able to play on um, the different types of white savior tropes, um, you will see this um, movie referenced um, primarily because in my mind, I thought I was giving my students um, something valuable 
you need these classics to survive in this world because they're so prestigious and wonderful. So to be educated means I decide, I choose, somebody else chooses for you what it means to be educated. And today, as I look back at myself, and, and I would not choose that story um, in particular, um, because as I look at culturally responsive teaching curriculum and strategies, I realize that um, I need to give my students missing perspectives. I need to introduce counter narratives, not the primary majority culture, but other narratives so that they can see themselves in the stories that they can learn from them. And I'm building relationships and not focusing on curriculum that I think is valuable, but stories that I think the students um, would choose themselves given that opportunity to participate in helping to build that curriculum. So that's kind of my way of making myself vulnerable um, that I've changed over the years and what my curriculum looks like and what I think um, students should be learning in my class and what I incorporate into my lessons. So we do have a Jamboard. Um, I know we're a little past time, but we want people to be able to participate um, and the Jamboard itself is something that you can do so anonymously. So you can, you can be in your discomfort, but at the same time, you can contribute. Um, so as you reflect, um, somebody's going to put the link in the chat for the Jamboard and you should be able to access it. Anyone with the link should be able to access it. So please let me know if you cannot get in there. I just want to double check and make sure I gave everybody editing privileges, which I believe that I did. Um, okay. So um, here's our question. How does white saviorism show up in ABE? And I just want to caution everybody, um, what Chris had mentioned at the very beginning is sort of reflect on yourself as much as you can, not on what you saw other people doing. But if you can reflect on your own practice, um, and this is an opportunity for growth. So we're going to invite you to, to write on the Jamboard. Um, and then I'm just going to check in with my colleagues and see if we're going to continue with the presentation while people write or because of timing, or how do we want to proceed? So I'll just pause for a moment and get some direction. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing, Tammy. Um, there's invitations to type in the chat if you're OK with your comment being under your name. It's anonymous in Jamboard, but I think maybe I'll keep um, keep moving. Yep. Okay. Yep, and just letting people know that if you want to use a sticky note, like some of these people are doing, the person who's drawing it might be a little tricky for you, um, unless you have a stylus. But there is there are two pages, so if you're on page one, that's where you want to put your sticky notes. But I'm gonna I'm gonna proceed back to the presentation. Please feel free to continue adding um, items to the Jamboard, and those will be available later as well. I see a couple of comments already coming in that there are too many people in the Jamboard. Yeah, this session is huge. Thank you all for being here. Um, but after you add your comment, if you want to close it, that'll open it up for more people. And it's going to be the same Jamboard for the rest of the presentation. So you'll have a chance if you don't get to right away. And we can add more, we can add more slides for sure. But I'm going to proceed with the next portion. OK, Chris? Yes. OK, so. Um, this is solidarity, not charity. So we talked about the charity part, um, this white savior attitude. So now we wanna talk about like this idea of solidarity. And um, Aaron and I got to spend a lot of time with um, Sydney doing the uh, anti-racist praxis study circle and unpacking a lot of Zaretta Hammond's book. Um, and one idea that really stood out to me was around learning partnerships. And the way that learning partnerships really get us out of this, I have the knowledge, I'm gonna help you attitude and like put us on more of a level playing field that this, this is a partnership. Um, and the ways that Zaretta Hammond uh, talks about forming these learning partnerships is first by reducing the social emotional stress, the stereotype threat and microaggressions in the classroom. And again, this is a situation where this is the work that we have to do within ourselves and then make sure that that's reflected in the classroom culture that we're creating. Um, this really requires us to unpack attitudes that we um, are steeped in in society. And so we've adopted and that we need to, to um, dismantle. Um, being a warm demander is something else that she talks about. And this one really hits the nail on the head for me. Um, 
We need to be warm. We need to have rapport with our students, relationship with our students, understand their situations, understand their needs, um, build that trust. And we need to be a demander. Um, I think sometimes when we fully understand the challenges that our students experience, we want to remove every barrier from their path. And by doing so, we undercut all of their abilities and the things that they're able to achieve and, and their confidence in themselves. Um, and being a warm demander means that I understand and have a relationship with you and I have high expectations for you because I know you can meet them. Um, and so then these other steps are really how, how do we get there? Um, we're we're going to cultivate positive mindsets, that sense of self-efficacy that students know that they are capable. Um, not because the teacher told me I could do it, not because of what you taught me, but because I know that I am capable. Um, students are taking ownership of their learning um, and they are learning that metacognitive language to describe their learning and their learning moves. This last piece, rapport and alliance equals cognitive insight. I feel like it's so um, condensing of all of this that we need that relationship, we need that rapport in order to become allies of our students. Um, we're not this benevolent like superhero, we're an ally, this is uh, solidarity. And that's where that cognitive insight comes from. So as promised, we wanted to suggest some ways that we can behave differently as educators in our field. Um, over uh, in recent years and the time since those uh, Facebook posts that I showed you, um, I've been able to be part of IMABE, which is a teacher and student led grassroots self advocacy group. Uh, so as opposed to sharing like patronizing stories um, <laughs> on social media, we have a, a social media tool here where students can safely share their own stories and advocate for themselves. Uh, we are uh, on the verge of posting videos with student interviews and their own opinions about um, adult education and what they want out of it. So amplifying student voices is critical. And Chris, do you want to tell your story? Yes, I was looking for the mute button. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so I, I talked about the student with the socks previously. Um, a few years down the road, I had another situation where a student was attending class with a rag between her legs. And I think previous versions of myself um, would have like, I don't know, purchased what I thought she needed and like secretly put it in the bathroom or something like that. And instead, um, we sort of had a team meeting. We had a conversation with the student, found out why she was doing that. She didn't have the hygiene products that she needed. We purchased the specific hygiene products that she asked for that were appropriate for her and then made those available. Um, and I think that, you know, in and of itself shows uh, some movement in thinking while preparing for this session. I also remembered another story even more years later where a student felt comfortable in the classroom community to share that they had not had food in their home for several days um, because they ran out of money and um, the students themselves organized a collection and gave her um, money and I think sometimes we think oh all of our students are in these situations they can't be asked to do that but there was a sense of community and solidarity in that classroom and I think she walked away with several hundred dollars um, to meet her family's needs. Just adding on to what everybody has talked about, um, sitting in that discomfort, which I would say um, in building my curriculum, uh, my focus went away from thinking about myself, what needs to happen versus listening to my students, as Chris just talked about, what are their concerns? What are their needs? What are they worried about in the world? What is it that they want to navigate that we could assist them um, in a way that's, that, has, that gives dignity and allows them to have a voice 
and that we can um, expose them to other uh, perspectives as well, other counter narratives, other missing perspectives that are not in the literature books traditionally, that are not always in the canon, that are not always inclusive of, of other people. And so as we sit and we listen and build those relationships, our students will tell us things and we can use that information um, to build our curriculum. Um, at this point, we're supposed to go back to the Jamboard, but I am going to just make an executive decision to proceed to the next slide because we have some really good stuff and we wanna just make sure that we're not going way over time. Um, but please know the Jamboard is available for you to reflect on later and add your, your personal comments and such, okay? So looking at this next slide. Um, yeah. So the return to that Jamboard, um, if you get an opportunity to go in there or if you wanna put in the chat is really an opportunity for you to represent maybe your growth since the first story you shared or ways you want to grow. And that's what this is as well. So um, this uh, first purple box, um, asks you to name a student that you were able to form a strong trusting relationship with and you can do this like self-reflective you don't have to write about it if you don't want to um and reflect on what made that bond effective and successful what was difficult about forming that bond um what deliberate steps did you take to cultivate that relationship what did you learn from that student i saw that some people were writing things along these lines in in the chat right like um we talk about this but how seriously do we take it that we are learning from our students um and sometimes they provide us support i think many of us probably experienced that during the pandemic when we all got thrown in this boat together um everybody was learning um and supporting one another and then um what what about that experience are you going to take into the future we have this other these concentric circles on the left, because maybe as I read these questions out, you're realizing I didn't have a relationship like that with a student. This is something that I want to do in the future. And so you can then be reflecting on um, what are the things preventing those kinds of relationships from forming, and then identify where the agency is in that. What about that? What behaviors and actions and attitudes are within your control that you can actively start changing? What are things that you don't have control over but you can influence maybe in your program? We also talked about um, in developing this session that sometimes um, we can try to do all these things, but if students don't want that kind of relationship with you, like you, you can put all the pieces in place, but it really is their decision to engage in that. Um, and then, if there are things that are completely outside of your control and influence, what are the things that we can accept and what are the things that we can't accept that we need to um, continue working on? So we are like right at time. Um, like we said, we're sitting in discomfort, none of this is solved. Um, we do uh, wanna share our contact information with all of you uh, so that, we can continue these conversations. We are really hoping to have a longer format to share this and reflect on this more in the future for you all. Um, and then there is one more slide after that with many of the links and resources that we've discussed um, throughout today, if you want to dig in further, including that video. Yes, the video is on the bottom. If you play it yourself, you will not, you will be very glad that you did. So I just highly encourage you if you have time in your schedule, it's not, it's not long, please do play the video. It, it puts a lot of the pieces together for me, at least it, it encapsulated a lot of learning in a really quick way. And it gave me a lot to think about. Um, where can we access the slides? Um, is everything going to be available in a in in? Um, I know Hamlin Atlas has created a way for all of all of the things to be available. So yeah, the slides will be available. Definitely. Tammy, yes. Tammy, this is Christine. So Tammy, 